This is a book club. Good morning. We've been reading a very real book about history. Um, we have read through chapter five last week. Are you ready for all these wars? And boy, I wasn't ready. Um, also want to shout out Andrew Jackson on our $20 bill for being one of the worst people ever to walk this earth. Uh, newly upset about stories I've heard about him in this book. Um, but it's, I think, connecting a lot of the dots um, of some of the animusness uh, in the fabric of society uh, in America. And uh, so we're going to continue. We're going to read two chapters today. We're going to read The True Relief, uh, chapter six, and then also chapter seven, The Outer Edge. And um, then at the end of today, uh, just to get us in the mood, I found on YouTube a woman who was like born in like 1870 talking about, you know, her life and her family and her father was born in 1800. Uh, it's a white lady. And then I think it's, you know, she just happened to be very old when the recording was done. Uh, she happened to be incredibly lucid and a really good storyteller. And I think we'll just play some at the end of today's reading just so we can hear sort of the fabric of as close as possible as to like what it was like to live back then and like how people actually were and thought and talked and referred to other people. <laughs> Um, so, uh, and it's like a 10 minute long recording, uh, of her telling about the oldest story she knows about her life. So we'll play that at the end, uh, kind of like a period piece, but you know, much ado about nothing. This is a gosh darn book club. So let's get the damn books. Disaster Girl, I'll be your tour guide for today. And where are we going? to the beginning formations of America. That's where we're going. So buckle up uh, as we pick up uh, where we left off. And so earlier in 1748, Montesquieu, okay, f first of all, reading chapter six of True Leaf, a kind of life not incompatible with health. Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, the, it's called The End of Myth. The book is at the top. Uh, it's a history book. It's very real about American history. Um, it's not your uh, school-censored version, that's for sure. I think you have everything you need. I'm not sure why you're so cry-cry today. Oh, you're upset because I left this in the way. That was my cat, Marcus. Okay. Y'all about these books? All right. Earlier in 1748, Montesquieu gave a sense of what a republic organized around something other than hmm, same stock racism and property rights might look like. The French political theorist who influenced Madison and other founders provided a list of what good government owed its citizens, a certain subsistence, a proper nourishment, convenient clothing and a kind of life not incompatible with health. It was a list that would later reflect the demands of some radical labor organizations in the United States, but to refound the country as a social republic would have required breaking the Jacksonian coalition and refuting its justifying premises. A break finally came with the Civil War. Good morning, Tiziana. My summer is going quite well. It's very rainy today, but it's still summer. Such a break finally came with the Civil War. In other places, the kind of carnage the United States inflicted on itself in the war forced governments to attend. In 1848, for instance, a Prussian doctor who treated Berlin's revolutionary victims of counter-revolutionary violence would go on to transform the first premise of liberalism. The people have a right to life into a new socialized right to health and health care. In subsequent upheavals, in wars and epidemics and famines that took place in Crimea, France and Rhine, among other places, 
Physicians and nurses continued to develop the principles of social medicine and public health. In 19th century South America, a war fought between Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, and Uruguay that brought an unimaginably high unalive toll laid the foundation of more socially active states. (coughs) My apologies. And in the early 20th century, Mexico's prolonged violent revolution, millions unalived, millions displaced, culminated in the world's first social democratic constitution. War itself rapidly spurred improvements in trauma treatment, in fixing gunshot wounds, in stemming bleeding, in amputating limbs, in setting bones, and figuring out how to improve collective hygiene to contain infectious diseases. In the early 1880s, when Peruvian soldiers returned to Lima from the battlefield carrying smallpox, government intervention in the economy was to prevent an epidemic, forcing the cleanup of market stalls, for example, or regulating the sale of meat. It was cast as patriotic. Throughout human existence, as sociologist Karl Polanyi wrote, death and decay had been the most elemental part of daily life. But starting in the late 1700s and increasingly through the 1800s, the rapid expansion of capitalism gave ever greater numbers of people a sense that maybe it didn't need to be that way. That escape from worldly misery might be possible. The same capitalist technology, though, also greatly increased the capacity of states to unalive and maim. Battlefields grew in size. Unalive tolls rose to new heights, and so did the numbers of soldiers coming home wounded. Since advances in medicine meant more men were surviving amputations, infectious diseases, and bullet wounds, writing at the end of World War II, Polanyi said that this clash brought about by institutional capitalism between an expanding sense of possibility and an equally expanding experience of destruction led to knowledge of society, a a realization that the freedom created by industrial growth did have limits, and that laissez-faire, if left unchecked, destroy on the same scale that it created. Woo, buddy, woo! Yes, yes, yes. A direct confrontation with the physicality of unaliving and dismemberment, with having to dispose of severed limbs and rotting corpses, settle and feed uprooted refugees, well, they tend to dysenteric fevers and calm shell-shocked veterans expanded social consciousness. In continental Europe, Prussia created the first fully developed welfare state after an unalively war with France. In the United Kingdom, the National Health Service was established after World War II. In the United States, the unprecedented bloodshed of the Civil War in the heartland, not on the borderlands where it could be more easily ignored, forced questions about union, citizenship, freedom, and human dignity. And as Drew Gilpin Faust writes in The Republic of Suffering and pushed the state to address the needs of those who have unalived in its service, From the stump of an arm, the amputated hand, Walt Whitman wrote in poem, capturing his experience as a volunteer nurse in camp hospitals. I undo the clotted lint, remove the sloth, and wash off matter and blood. Walt Whitman was in there. The fulfillment of such duties, Faust writes, provided an important vehicle for the expansion of federal power that characterized and transformed the post-war nation. The establishment of national cemeteries and the emergence of the Civil War pension system to care for both the unalived and their survivors yielded programs of scale and reach unimaginable before the war. And unalive created the modern American Union, not just by ensuring national survival, but by shaping, enduring, national structures and commitments. Such 
battle forged commitments laid the foundation of the country's modern welfare system. In addition to the provision of pensions and burial plots, they included bounty land, hospital care, support for widows, mothers, and the elderly, disability insurance, and an increasing concern for the mental health of veterans. These are new concepts, new concepts. People are like, I don't know. Maybe we should think about mental health. Maybe we should think about mental health. Nah, let's not do that. <clears throat> the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, which Faust doesn't discuss, is an especially powerful example of how war led the state to attend to the needs. The Freedmen's Bureau, signed into law by Abraham Lincoln just before his uh, assassination in 1865. Fun fact, William Shakespeare, I think, invented the word assassination. <laughs> before his, uh, Abraham Lincoln, right before his assassination in 1865, functioned as a branch of the Department of War, sending out thousands of agents across the South and setting up hundreds of offices. The Bureau distributed basic necessities, including food, medicine, and clothing. It also founded thousands of schools, colleges, and hospitals, and resettled refugees, white and black, and administered confiscated properties. And it made and it made and executed ad hoc laws. It regulated labor relations and minimum wages. And it levied taxes. W.E.B. Du Bois, writing in the early 20th century, called the Freedmen's Bureau the most extraordinary and far-reaching institution of social uplift that America has ever attempted. Ooh, this Freedmen's Bureau is doing its damn thing. America, you did it. Okay, so that's, that's a plus. You know, we celebrate the wins. They're far and few between. Good morning, Kayla. I can see you. Good morning, Susan. Uh, yeah, W.E.D. Boy is singing this praise. It says the Freedmen's Bureau is the most extraordinary and far-reaching institution of social uplift that America has ever attempted. Woo! And the Bureau was, in potential and practice, the antithesis to the Jacksonianism, an instrument of extraordinary power. From my understanding of today, Jackson, Andrew Jackson, and the whole wave of people, Jacksonianism, he seems a lot like DeSantis, like someone who's like exceptionally cruel and, you know, like, and so... Like, the politics of that time around then, it was, like, the Jacksonians versus, like, the Whigs. You know, like, the old school, like, very still British kind of people. And then the Jacksonian people were like, let's just unalive everyone who's darker than us. And people were like, yeah, and steal their land. And he's like, that's going to be awesome. He was like, people are property. woo <laughs> Okay. But after he's left the presidency, it's a good, kind of a different vibe coming through okay so this bureau the freedmen's bureau was in potential and practice the antithesis to jacksonianism an instrument of extraordinary power and the federal government's assumption of responsibility for the welfare of a large body of its citizens <coughs> one historian describing the agency's mandate put it mildly was a concept of national authority alien to the constitutional thought of the day Gone were the pastoral images of a government as a simple machine, like a lazily turning mill wheel on a steam. The state was now hissing and screeching, a hurtling locomotive, its Freedmen's Bureau, the symbol of substance of military occupation. The Bureau helped poor people of all colors, low down whites, <laughs> and venerable Negroes. As one of its agents put it, as historian Nancy Eisenberg writes, it treated them not as cutthroat adversaries, but, of, but as the worthy poor. And in the Deep South in Alabama, Arkansas, Missouri, and Tennessee, the Bureau extended twice 
and in some cases four times as much relief to whites as to blacks. Okay, well that was kind of the in every institution at the time. <laughs> the Bureau promised universal equality and provided substantial assistance. In actual operations were somewhat different from what a, so a socialist like Dubois wanted them to be. Underfunded and understaffed, the Bureau made enormous concessions to the old planter class, the slave owners, especially when it came to getting the cotton economy started again. And it didn't have anywhere near the personnel to protect freed people from violence. To appreciate the force of the backlash against the agency, it's useful to consider not just what it did, but what it represented. Its potential, as Du Bois imagined it, as an organic form of American socialism and embryo. A model for the vast and single-eyed. An instrument of centralized government needed to guide us up from the unaliving in the South and robbery and cheating in the North into a nation whose infinite sources, I hate when people keep saying infinite sources, it's not infinite, a nation whose infinite sources would be developed in the interest of the mass of the nation. That is, of the laboring poor. Man, this Freedmen's Bureau sounds pretty wildly awesome, underfunded, but interesting. If ever there was a time for the birth of a social republic, for an end to an expansionist morality, where the solution to all problems... The solution to all problems was to flee forward. That was it. The South was under military occupation. Its plantations seized and planter class surviving at the sufferance of its vanquishes. But that social republic was not to be. <coughs> hmm. I'm going to take a 20 second coffee break. Mm -mm -mm. Of course, we know that's not what it ended up being. That's not what it ended up being at all. Number three. Chattel slavery was a 300-year-old institution, congealed, Dubois writes, in law. Slave traders took millions upon millions of men, human men, and lovable, light, and liberty-loving children of the sun, and threw them with no sparing of brutality into one rigid mold. Slavery, he continued, was a school of brutality and human suffering, whose pedagogy was the darkening of reason, serial grape, and spiritual unalive. Destroyed by the Union Army, slavery left millions of survivors stretching from the Potomac to the Rio Grande, from Florida to Missouri. Andrew Johnson, who became president upon Abraham Lincoln's assassination in April 1865, thought that these survivors should help themselves. <laughs> Slaves were assisted to freedom, said Johnson, with the expectation that on becoming free, they would be self-sustaining population. And Johnson here was explaining why he had vetoed a bill extending the Freedmen's Bureau. He did so, he said, because... Any le legislative action based on the idea that freed men and freed women wouldn't quickly attain a self-sustaining condition would be injurious to their character and their prospects. Wow, he said even suggesting to help the newly freed people would be injurious to their character because they will just become self-sustaining equal individuals by themselves instantly. Well, we know that didn't happen. <laughs> Congress overrode Johnson's veto, and the Bureau went on for seven more years. Johnson did all he could to stymie the empowerment of former slaves, including pardoning their former masters turned rebels and returning much of their property. His attacks on the Bureau were heartfelt. He hated the idea of the institution, but his campaign was also strategic. Upon taking office, Johnson, a member of the Democratic Party, quickly fell out with the Congressional Republicans who wanted to extend Reconstruction. The demonization of the Bureau, then, 
allowed Johnson a way to use racism to build up his own political base among poor whites. Even as he signaled to Southern planters, known as the Bourbon Democrats (laughs) or Redeemers, that he would do what he could to preserve their power and privileges. Just as today, when simply mentioning a topic, say Obamacare, for say, can call forth a whole racialized worldview whose details needed to be filled in. The phrase Freedmen's Bureau alone whistled its meaning. Here's the transcript from one of Johnson's speeches. Now, my countrymen, let me call your attention to a single fact. The Freedmen's Bureau. Ha <laughs> boo! Ha uh, boo! The Freedmen's Bureau. Laughter and hisses. Most of Johnson's northern and southern audiences had been raised in the Church of Andrew Jackson's primitive simplicity and purity. Do you think it's like people were like, Andrew Jackson, yeah, he's our like go to a ranger murderer dude. And then do you think that because Andrew Johnson was elected after Abraham Lincoln, like the similarity of names, like Andrew Jackson, Andrew Johnson, and then both standing for the same thing, like maybe that helped his election. I'm just throwing spitballs out there. Most of Johnson's northern and southern audiences thank you, black sheep, had been raised in the church of Andrew Jackson's primitive simplicity and purity and its already racialized understanding of the federal government. When any publicly administered social program would be seen as but an opening for extraneous corrupting influences, and so their shared, already understood animosity to the Freedmen's Bureau, which needed nothing but laughter and hisses to convey, made it easy for the president to shift all of the problems of post-war civil America, all of those problems, its corruption, its concentration of power, the low wages, and inadequate housing, onto African Americans and their bloodsucker advocates in Congress. Radical Republicans such as Thaddeus Stevens and uh, Wendell Phillips who are trying to fund the Bureau. Okay, so you got these Republicans who are like, okay, we have this Freedmen's Bureau, uh, President Andrew Johnson, and he's like, all of the world's problems are because of these Black people. This whole Freedmen's Bureau, I I can't even support, like, does this sound like anything? Does this sound familiar to anybody? (laughs) That somehow every problem in America is because of this population of people. Are you sure? This is the part. This is the rub. This is the rub right here where people are like, oh my God, black people get over slavery. You know, you get told that on the internet all the time. And I feel like we, you know, just to me, like the impacts of slavery are not as devious or interesting as all of this stuff. All of this like double speak psychological, uh, like, undercutting of reconstruction into something that was putting them at a possibly even worse stance um and then an international campaign of like bad pr which today like you you couldn't even do you know how much you'd have to pay as like a company if you wanted a movie screened in the white house right like h- how much would that how much would you have to pay for that well people were doing that And not only that, like the first movie in the White House was just racist propaganda. Ad buys you couldn't even buy today. You the people, Johnson told an audience in Indianapolis in 1866, must pay the expense of running the machine out of your own pocket. Whoa, these newly freed slaves are all the world's problems. (laughs) Okay. Johnson presided over a period of unmitigated venality, with land speculators and railroad magnates supping at the public trough. He decried the Bureau's modest efforts as the essence of corruption and patronage, and he portrayed its draw day, distribution of corn, as creating a new class of dependence 
Oh my God. Have you heard this before? Uh, cl- creating a new class of dependents attached to the government, all while the railroad magnets are sucking up so much public funding to do what? <laughs> they could afford it to finance their own project. A class composed of both the bureaucrats who administered the provision and the recipients of the largesse. Then, just in case anyone in the audience missed the point, Johnson asked what his veto of the bureau meant. And an answer came back from the crowd. It's keeping the N-word down. Damn, that's our president post-slavery post saying that? Come on, that's pretty ugly. <laughs> Come on, man. Post-slavery, we have presidents saying this in speeches. We're going to keep these N-words down. Mm-mm. You don't think that had an effect? Oh, my goodness. As portrayed by Johnson and others, the Bureau, along with other civil legislation, was unnatural in its interventionism, in its effort to use political power to impinge on economic activity and to extend political and to extend political equality into the social realm. But in the words of Missouri Republican House member James Blair, to force the Negroes into social equality, Blair stood with the Union during the war, opposed formal slavery, but he supported equality before the law. But he was opposed to legislation that tried to use the ideal of political equality to force tavern and hotel owners to serve any freed men and women, or ministers and doctors to care for them at all. Ethiopia, Blair said, referring to efforts to desegregate the churches, is now stretching forth her hand and demanding rights that white men never dared demand. The right to regulate the worship of the white people. Emancipation for Blair blurred the line between foreign and domestic spheres, introducing an alien threat into the heartland of liberty. Well, Ethiopia, with her millions of voters at her back, huh? And demanding that one of the most sacred principles, the right to free worship of American freemen, be trampled underfoot. So that's so crazy. He's just calling the people who have been in America for a long time, maybe longer than a lot of the settlers. He just called them Ethiopians. <laughs> that's what he's calling freed people. Yes, exactly. It's a lot of doublespeak. It's a lot of doublespeak, NASA. The Civil War destroyed the Jacksonian political coalition, but not its myths. The backlash to the Freedmen's Bureau rooted out all of its old ideas concerning the virtues of a minimal state, the racialization of any welfare-providing bureaucracies, and the sanctity of property rights, individualism, and a definition of freedom as is freedom from restraint and cast them forward. President Johnson described the Bureau as a giveaway to blacks. And at a moment when freedmen and freed women were being unalived in staggeringly high numbers, the President of the United States said he favored the emancipation of the white man as well as the colored ones, complaining that the Bureau was both trapping African Americans in a new form of slavery and giving African Americans preferential jobs and resurrecting the Jacksonian opposition of free men fighting federal enslavement. Johnson described the agency as an effort to transfer 4 million of slaves in the United States from their original owners to a new set of taskmasters. And to this, the crowd cheered and yelled back, never! And the Bureau was an agency to keep the Negro in idleness. These people who've been working themselves idleness. My goodness. And create a culture of dependency through the lavish issuance of rations. Wow. Meanwhile, these like coal and railroad magnets are fleecing the country. Fleecing them. Johnson's racist gambit didn't help his political fortunes. And he did not get his party's nomination for re-election in 1868. Wow. And usually people repeat, like, you know, incumbent people, you should repeat. General Ulysses 
S. Grant won the presidency, allowing the radical phase of Reconstruction, already launched by congressional Republicans, to carry on. And the military continued to occupy the South, and national laws and constitutional amendments were passed that allowed Black men to vote and to run for office in principle and in fact. And in 1867, no African Americans held any office. But within three years, they held 15% of all elected positions at the local, state, and national level. Wow. The Bureau's work went on, though, still underfunded. And many of its functions passed to other agencies of of the army. Wow, that's crazy. Within three years, uh, black people were 15% of all elected positions. That looks like it gets a fun sticky for me. <laughs> it's got a little lingo like the bang, 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 bang. Okay. Then in 1872, the Bureau's chief commissioner, General Olive Otis Howard was reassigned by the Department of War to Arizona, and the politics behind this new commission was complicated. Yet, the symbolism of reassignment itself was stark. It captured the priorities of a nation now unified, industrializing, and ascendant in the world, turning away from the past, from the bloody obligations of reconstruction toward the future to the frontier, a place not of obligation, but opportunity. And Howard was a Christian opponent of slavery, a believer in the true religion, who called the bureau he ran the true relief. And he deployed that the bureau's power with a single-mindedness of purpose that realized Andrew Jackson's nightmare the apothesis of that federal agent on the Natchez Trace, the no, the apotheosis of that federal agency on the Natchez Trace, the one who Andrew Johnson Jackson made lose his job, and now in the form of the federal government itself, when Johnson had earlier vetoed the Bureau's renewal, he described Howard as an absolute monarch with the power to determine the rights of persons and property. And Howard himself described his work advancing a different, more social understanding of freedom. Yes, freedom can have more than one definition to more than one people. And we need to discuss a more social understanding of freedom than those individualistic ones used as a cudgel by Jackson, Johnson, and others to keep people of color down. The Bureau, Howard said, was bound to put its foot firmly upon every form of slavery in an effort to help freemen achieve true emancipation from unregulated labor markets and from old masters, if left unchecked, would use any ploy to create new forms of bondage, including vagrancy laws, debt peonage, and collective contracts. Howard deeply believed that in the virtues of individuality, of initiative and self-control, but he knew concerted government force to protect emancipated people from night rider terror and to guarantee them right to vote and to provide food and education was needed to make individual independence a reality for the victims of slavery. Howard, in other words, was no Jacksonian, to say the least. But Howard's management of the Bureau had been controversial. The Bureau naturally remained a target of unrelenting criticism by Southern planters and politicians who leveled charges of corruption, incompetence, and despotism at Howard. Understaffed and greatly underfunded, especially considering the geographic range the agency was meant to administer, Howard couldn't offset these criticisms by pointing to efficient, clear accomplishments and the sprawling and often contradictory nature of the Bureau's mandate to contain planter power 
administer basic welfare, establish schools and hospitals, and revive the cotton economy. Well, that sparked conflict. And the Bureau tried to create a wage economy, but pay on cotton plantations remained unsustainably low, leading to what some have called slavery by another name, and to the spread of debt peonage and sharecropping. In any case, rather than leaving him to finish his work, with the Bureau, Howard's superiors sent him west, where he was put to blazing his own trail of tears. First, he was sent to the Arizona Territory to negotiate a peace with the Apaches, and then he was assigned to the Pacific Northwest to deal with Chief Joseph, who was resisting federal officers' efforts to force the Nez Perce to vacate the Wallow Valley to make room for white settlers. Howard was still facing criticism over his zealous administration of the Freedmen's Bureau, not just by Southern planters, but in the national press and the ranks of the military, where his enemies were investigating his management of the Bureau for abuse. The Wallows, white settlers, had followed the Civil War and Reconstruction closely, and they knew of Howard's reputation. Though far removed from the South, they nonetheless had carried forth a Jacksonian hostility to federal power and were ready to treat Howard the way the general treated was treated by the Southern whites. And for his part, Howard, as his biographer notes, felt that if he took it upon himself to champion and then enforce a policy that favored Joseph, that if he did in Wallowa what he tried to do at the Freedmen's Bureau, testing the law to its limits in order to achieve something unpopular, but just that he'd continue to be pilloried and would perhaps even put his military career at risk. So Howard took a hard line against Chief Joseph, and he gave Nez Perce an ultimatum to surrender their homeland, which they rejected. And Joseph's fought back and then retreated, setting out a brutal 1,500-mile trek and Howard pursued the Nez Perce for nearly four months over the Rockies and across Man Montana's plains and his troops' unalived scores. And only about half of the 800 who started out on the march survived. They were packed into boxcars and taken to Oklahoma. NASA says my friend, former daughter-in-law, geek, has Apache mitochondrial DNA. Yes. Meanwhile, with Howard in the West, opponents of the Freedmen's Bureau and the War Department managed to shut the agency down. By this point, it was the middle of the 1870s. Let me mind you, the Civil War ended in 1865. So by the 1870s, any Office of Reconstruction was officially closed down. <laughs> so hateful. N not even 10 years. Not even. White vigilantism against African Americans had grown so intense that President Ulysses S. Grant considered trying to acquire the Dominican Republic as a homeland for freedmen and freed women. Wow. <laughs> he was going to get the DR and just be like, everybody go to the Dominican Republic. This is way too many lynchings. What a solution. Grant had initiated his annexation effort prior to a massacre <laughs> that took place on Easter Sunday in 1873 in Colfax, Louisiana, which left between 62 and 150 African Americans unalived at the hands of a white mob. But that atrocity must have been on his mind. When in his last address to Congress in 1876, he explained his reasons for wanting the Dominican Republic. Thus, in cases of great oppression and cruelty, such as has been practiced upon them in many places within the last 11 years, whole communities would have sought refuge in Santo Domingo. And I do not suppose the whole race would have gone nor is it desirable that they should go. 
Their labor is desirable, <laughs> indispensable almost, where they now are. But the possession of this territory would have left the Negro master of the situation, if you know what I mean, over down there in the Dominican Republic, by enabling him to demand his rights at home on pain of finding them elsewhere. They said, oh, he said he could also, they could also use it as leverage. Be like, y'all, if you don't treat us right, we're just going to go to the Dominican Republic. <laughs> also, thank you for the gold star and the heart. Grant, <laughs> look, Grant, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> passport boys, <laughs> let's go. Sorry. Uh, Grant, in other words, imagined the Dominican Republic as a substitute for the Freedmen's Bureau, achieving all the things that the government agency was meant to accomplish, specifically protecting African Americans and making sure that their labor was adequately compensated. The proposal didn't go forward, but Grant, in proposing a place where emancipated slaves might be masters of their situation, both acknowledged the depth of the problem in this case, the deadly post-Civil War combination of racial terror and the Southern plantation economy's starvation wages, and admitted that the problem wouldn't be solved under existing political and economic arrangements. I mean, the DR ain't bad, you know? <sighs> the bureaucratic machinery for Western expansion, including the Department of Agriculture, the Morrill Land Grant Act, and the Pacific Railroad Act, and the Homestead Act was put in place even before the Civil War had ended. In fact, the ability of the Union to win the war, historians Boyd Cothran and Ari Kelman write, was based on a trade-off. Men could enlist to fight for Lincoln and Liberty and receive as fair recompense for their patriotic sacrifices, higher education and Western land connected by rail to markets. It seemed possible that liberty and empire <laughs> might advance in lockstep. The Homestead Act embodied that imperial liberty, the fruit of the free soil movement, promising large lots to any settler who would work them and the federal government distributed a bit under 300 million acres of public land to about 400,000 families. Ooh, that's a lot of public land. 300 million acres of public land to about 400,000 families. This was less than half of the acreage private interests acquired through purchase. Ooh! Within a decade of the Act's passage, large capitalists and speculators had laid, laid claim to the most fertile, most irrigated, and via railroad lines, best connected portion of the public free land. The corruption and fraud that marked the Johnson administration continued through the 1870s and the 1880s at an even greater scale. And the federal government had land to distribute, patronage to dispense, contracts to award, and other favors, <laughs> including tariffs and subsidies to shower on its allies. It was a great barbecue, <laughs> was how the historian uh, Vernon Parrington in 1927 described the post-Civil War seizure of the West. He said it was like a big old barbecue. Woo! With the largest portions going to the most powerful corporations and conglomerates, it was a splendid feast. Everyone was invited. Democracy promised to feed all. And the eating and the drinking went on till only the great carcasses were left. And then at last came the reckoning. When the bill was sent in to the American people, they discovered 
they had been put off with giblets while the capitalists were consuming the turkey. Business as usual. And by this point, energy to fuel all of this activity was becoming its own economic sector. And the increasing demand for power was leaving marks on the land. Cool capitalists, followed by pioneers of petroleum, swarmed into the valleys of the Appalachia. By the way, this was someone else's land. There's treaties being broken left and right here. Uh, into the valleys of Appalachia. Dispossessing smallholders and stripping the hills and hollows, denuded of their forests, was how one turn of the century witnessed, imagined the near future. The valley is lighted by flames of coke ovens and smelting furnaces, their vegetation seared and blackened with soot and gases, derricks like the skeletons along the streams, yawning mines and piles of slack disfiguring the once pleasing landscape. And one could wish such an Arcadia might have been spared such ravishment, but the needs of the race are insatiable and unceasing, and they must be supplied. And one after another, the reserves stored by nature in the hidden places of the earth must be brought out to feed the perpetual hunger of the world's commerce. Yo, so these people just went, broke all these treaties, kicked these native people out, um, and then destroyed the land, destroyed the land's future, destroyed millennia of nature's work. For what? What, what right did they have to do all that? In the 1870s, a severe economic downturn a nasa says rural tennessee around me mainly oblivious to wealthy owning percent of the wealth yeah in the 1870s a severe economic downturn accompanied by a wave of militant strikes led some to worry that a second civil war seemed imminent oh what this time a class war along with intensified terror directed at freedmen and women now that the federal government had withdrawn its protection to focus on the final campaign to pacify the West. Wow. So people were saying there's got to be a second civil war because the government was like, okay, enough about protecting these black people. Let's go unalive some native people, shall we? <laughs> Later in the decade, after years of contraction, the economy revived rapidly. Such cycles of extended busts, followed by dizzying booms, only served to deepen commitment to the idea of expansion. During the busts, expansion was the proposed solution, and the validity of which was confirmed when the eventual boom finally came onward. As to foreign markets opened, large-scale export-oriented agriculture reinvested its soaring profits in technology, and mechanization, making it even more competitive, allowing those who stood at the summit of the sector of the economy to consolidate even more political power, and the same dynamic held for manufacturing. How much longer are we to continue blind to the demands for new markets for our already excessive and rapidly increasing production? asked Iowa Representative John Casson in 1881. And Casson's question captures the post-Civil War extension of the expansionist premise to overseas markets, extend the sphere to create new outlets for the country's growing agricultural and manufacturing exports, and you will avoid cyclical business crises as well as the popular unrest that comes with such crises. And you will have domestic peace. We are rapidly utilizing the whole of our continental territory, Casson said. We must turn our eyes abroad, <laughs> or they will soon look inward upon discontent. Whoa, this crazy foreshortening is crazy. He said, America can only work when it's expanding and stealing things from people. And we've worked, we've 
locked up most of the country now. We need to go abroad. Ooh. War produced unalive and revealed decay. And unalive and decay demanded public policy. But public policy threatened to lead to socialism, or at least to a more interventionist government empowered to stir up, as General Howard described the work of the Freedmen's Bureau, stir up all social life. There was an alternative, a chance to turn away from the Civil War's bloody battlefields and hence away from the reminders of the unalive and decay that forged the modern American Union. Read but your history all right, and you shall not find the task too hard, Woodrow Wilson wrote in 1895. Recommit the heroic work of moving outward into the world, Wilson said, and we shall renew our youth <laughs> and secure our age against decay. The frontier, said Frederick Jackson Turner at around the same time, was a magic fountain of youth in which America continually bathed and was rejuvenated. They're saying America only works as an expansionist nation, stealing and unalive and other people's stuff. Oof, and that is the chapter. We will read one more chapter today, The Outer Edge. Uh, let's get into it. Chapter 7, The Outer Edge. Good morning, John. Good morning, Megan. This great continent, then wild and silent. In the last decade of the 1800s, the historian Frederick Jackson Turner emancipated the concept frontier, unhitching it from the more mundane and earthbound meanings used to indicate a national border or military front, and letting it, and letting it float free as an abstraction. One sentence alone, which subsequent historians cite the way monks chant a creed, captures Turner's revolution. The existence of an area of free land as continuous recession and the advance of American settlement westward explain American development. Turner was an unnoticed assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin in 1893. Oh, he was unnoticed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when he first presented his frontier thesis at the World Congress of Historians and Historical Students held in Chicago during its World's Fair, the one stalked by a serial iller made famous in Eric Larson's The Devil in the White City. 32 professional historical writers and credentialed university scholars had gathered at Chicago's Art Institute, located some distance from the Loud Fairground, with its Buffalo Bills Wild West show and mock-ups of Native American villages. <laughs> wow. Late, on a late-in-the-day panel, Turner read his paper titled the significance of the frontier in American history. His sparse audience might have been tired, for no one asked a question. And Turner returned to his boarding house, his biographer writes, burdened with a sense of heavy failure. His argument grew quickly in reputation. Many of the scholars at the Chicago Conference thought of history writing mostly as a compendium of facts, dates, and names. And Turner, in contrast, was part of a new generation that was beginning to make and revise arguments about the past, trying to explain, as Turner wrote, the relationship between economics, migration, ideas, science, culture, and politics. There was, though, one influential historical argument prior to the Turner thesis, popular among New England Protestant historians, the germ theory which had nothing to do with literal bacteria or infections. See, what I think is going on is I think that this race of people, for the first time, are trying out structural thinking, understanding that all of these different, it's not just dates and facts, it's that they're, they're connected together. And this is the way that indigenous people think. And so this could also be part of the byproduct of cultures colliding, because America has and always has had four populations. One, 
the indigenous people here, two, the colonizers, three, the arrival, the arrivals. That's like people who were enslaved and brought here, like black people, ADOS, or Mexican people who were just living in their homes when the borders changed. So arrivals. And then the fourth category is immigrants, whether it's Ellis Island or Caravan. That's a good way to think of America. It's not one population. It's four. Uh, the germ theory held that what was good and strong about American institutions germinated in Europe. In ancient Saxon and Teutonic villages filled with freemen, not yet subordinated to the feudal lords. Applied to Germany and England, this theory was one of romantic decline, that a once free people, weighed down by the sediments of history, bureaucracy, ecclesiastical st strictures, and aristotic caste, untrammeled in the liberty which he enjoyed, the primitive Aryan, which this word Aryan is historically very dubious because it doesn't make sense when you get into it linguistically because, but this is a word that white people made up that is ahistorical and ascientific about themselves. Um, and that's important to know. So the primitive Aryan came to represent what the world had once possessed, which it possessed no longer. In North America, it was a theory of ascent of Saxon freedom spreading first to medieval England and then to New England. And the old Saxon race is destined to plant amid the wilds of the New World the germs of free institutions. Well, they brought germs, all right. <laughs> extending that old Columbian exchange, extending over a vast continent, read one succinct statement on the theory. So they're calling themselves germ theory, these, these Anglo-Saxons. They're saying, we will come over here and we will infect the new world. That's not a great way. Okay, you did. <laughs> the germ principle was straightforwardly racist, a celebration of the blood gene or the great Teutonic race. As one of the most prominent practitioners, Herbert Baxter Adams put it, and a confirmation of the continuity and superiority of Britain and North America's Saxon lineages, such as the Adamses, including John Samuel and John Quincy, down to Herbert himself. Of course, your family is the chosen family to infect the world. <laughs> of course. And if the study of history is the study of change, these early historians of the United States were decidedly ahistorical. <laughs> the, their germs were something like physicists, Big Bang, sudden and pristine. And when the Puritans landed, their institutions were already perfected. George Bancroft, among the country's most influential historians prior to Turner wrote, Woodrow Wilson, who studied with Turner, and under Adams at John Hopkins, argued in 1899 that early Christian settlers were inventing nothing, ideas that would later result in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were already formed upon their arrival in the New World. Americans, Wilson said, were simply letting their race, habits, and instincts, as developed in Europe, have natural play. Another historian wrote that the origins of the independent spirit of the American West was found to be in the forests of Germany and that the American frontiersmen were but replicas of Saxon, Teutonic, and Aryan, independent freemen. And Turner, in contrast, flipped the focus. He said that what was good in America was made in America by settlers transforming frontier wilderness, which they called free land. <laughs> this was someone's land. Free land he wrote, and an abundance of natural resources open to a fit people made the democratic type of society in America. Well, you squandered the resources and ruined the land as well. It's fixable, but it takes effort. America's unique democratic individualism, Turner held, 
was a new product that is American. American democracy came out of the American forest and it gained strength each time it touched a new frontier. The use of the word frontier had evolved as the United States grew, whereas in the late 1700s, the term as discussed earlier, nearly exclusively referred to as a boundary, that is the frontier, a border or military front. By the time of Turner's Chicago presentation, it had come to mean much, much more. What exactly it meant was subject to debate. Over the course of its existence, the United States political boundary moved forward rather steadily from the crest of the Alleghenies to the Mississippi River to the Sabine and Red Rivers to finally its current limit at Mexico and the Pacific Ocean. And let's look at that. I have a picture of it. So this was the Alleghenies. I guess we call it the Appalachian Mountains now. And then. This is the 1776, pretty much, formation of America. And then, and how we took. Over the course of its existence, the United States political boundary moved forward rather steadily from the crest of the Alleghenies to the Mississippi River, to the Sabine and Red Rivers, to finally its current limit at Mexico and the Pacific Ocean. Its line of white settlers along with its line of military force used to protect those settlers, moved forward in fits and starts, zigs and zags, sometimes east of the political boundary, sometimes west of it. Anglo society moved forward not as a uniform front against the Native Americans, but more fluidly, as if it were poured into the interests separating the Indian nations and communities. And as it did, the meaning of the word frontier diverged from that of the old border, which continued, more or less, to indicate a fixed line. Frontier became fuzzier. It came to suggest a cultural zone or a civilizational struggle, a way of life, a semantic change electrified by the terror and bloodshed that went along with the settler expansion. Turner's genius was to embrace the unsettledness of the concept, to, to not try to fix the frontier as any one thing. The term is an elastic one, he wrote, and for our purposes, it does not need sharp definition. Ooh, they prefer that. That's easier to gaslight. He then went on in his 1893 thesis to define frontier in at least 13 different ways. <laughs> to indicate, among other things, a form of society rather than an area, a return to primitive conditions, a field of opportunity, the outer edge of the wave, the meeting point between savagery and civilization. Why is civilization the one bearing sword, though? <laughs> Something that lies at the hither edge of free land, <laughs> the line of the most rapid, an effective Americanization. And for European immigrants, especially those who started arriving in the 1880s, in increasing numbers from Central and Southern Europe, a harsh environment that is almost too strong for the men and a gate of escape from the bondage of the past. There was a trader's frontier. There was a rancher's frontier, a miner's frontier, and a farmer's frontier. And these many different frontiers had many different functions. And in this sense, the power of Turner's thesis or theory was not that it was refutable or provable from a scientific or logical standard, but that it wasn't. The frontier could be posited as numerous things and speculated as the cause of multiple effects. And it cultivated a love of wilderness freedom and it nurtured the formation of a composite nationality for the American people, which in turn led to the evolution of American political institutions, and it promoted democracy and combined coarseness and strength with acuteness and inquisitiveness, and to create an archetype personality uniquely American, at once practical and inventive, fast to find 
expedience and displaying a masterful grasp of material things and lacking in the artistic but powerful to effect great ends. Such multifunctional complexity. <laughs> the frontier here and henceforth was a state of mind, a cultural zone, a sociological term of comparison, a type of society. It was an adjective, a noun, a national myth, a disciplining mechanism, an abstraction, and an aspiration. And at the same time, though, explanatory simplicity. The existence of an area of free land, continuous recession, and the advance of the American settlement westward explain American development. And within a decade of the 1893 paper, it became difficult to grapple with any of the main themes of American history without passing through Turner. And in 1922, Arthur Schleslinger, in his popular survey of U.S. history, said that so many books applied Turner's arguments that it would be impossible to list them all. And anyways, there was no point to summing up the frontier thesis. It was too well known, not just historians, but to economists, sociologists, philosophers, literature professors, psychoanalysts, pol politicians, novelists, both dime store and highbrow, and they all adopted Turnerian ideas. And two of Turner's fellow historians of the West, uh, Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, became president. And having moved from the Department of History at the University of Wisconsin to Harvard, Turner tutored, Turner tutored the country's ruling class, the intellectuals, the policymakers, the businessmen, and the career foreign service officers. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was one of his students. Let's see what they say about the Freedmasons, Howard. The Midwesterner Turner had seized the discipline of history from its Brahmin ministers, from the Adamses and the Bancrofts, disenchanting the Saxon fairy tale that located the origins of Madison's constitution and primeval German myths to be carried forth by the Saxon germs. And Turner instead emphasized what he called the germs of processes, the material and ideological forces, trade, legislation, technology, and science, law of the rise of new ideas concerning the relationship of the individual to the to the state, churning below the froth of great events and great men. Turner's main argument, which he advanced in his 1893 essay, as well as in subsequent writings, is straightforward. America's vast open West created the conditions for an unprecedented expansion of the ideal of political equality, an ideal based on a sense that the frontier would go on forever. The wilderness seemed so unending, left alone with their visions of unlimited resources. We need to chill with this. This thing, that's going to put us in the ground, baby. <laughs> unlimited resource and there's there's a limit to everything <laughs> stop you can't build your life on unlimited resources philosophy it's going to be a problem okay left alone with their visions of unlimited resources pioneers would transform nature and deepen democratic values independent personal initiative and above all individualism but also fairness honesty and trust, a kind of frontier mutualism. And in a harsh land, prior to the arrival of the state, pioneers had to find a balance between self-reliance and cooperation, extending relations of commerce and the rules of law. And when the government did show up and as local markets evolved into a national economy, these frontier values spread throughout the country, shaping its institutions. Frontier individualism, Turner said, didn't just exist on the frontier. It was found everywhere in the country, in its cities, in its villages, in its ports, because the existence of the frontier, that is because 
the individualism was generated on the frontier and because the frontier kept a check on other less wholesome tendencies including demands for wealth distribution. <laughs> that, more or less, is what Turner's argument is. But to understand Turner's revolution, one has to know what Turner's argument isn't. It isn't elitist. Other historians of the time might have credited Virginia's Tidewater gentlemen for developing the West, saying that it wasn't backwoods grit, but copious amounts of capital that cleared the land. He was saying that it wasn't backwards grit, but copious amounts of capital that cleared the land. The meaner sort of people, wrote one British report of Western settlement, seat themselves under the shade and protection, protection of the greater. And Turner, anticipating by many decades the modern impulse to document history from below, instead celebrated the hunters and the traders and the dirt farming families as the executors of progress. And in this sense, he was building on the Jacksonian impulse to exalt and empower the common man, not the man of substance, but the man of soil. And Jacksonian exaltation and empowerment, though, was racist. And Turner isn't, at least not overtly, he wasn't concerned with identifying racial purity as history's kickstarter, the way that the others searched for the originating Saxon germ of America's greatness. For instance, one of Turner's mentors, Herbert Howe Bancroft, hailed the great Aryan march of centuries, the mother race, and Anglo-Saxon blood as carrying forward everything that is good about America and the power driving the United States out in the world, said Senator Albert J. Beveridge, not long after Turner presented his Chicago paper, was racial. And in, and in it, it was racial and it was divisive. God had been preparing the English speaking and Teutonic peoples for a thousand years, the senator continued. He had made us the master organizers of the world and to establish system where chaos reigns said beveridge is the divine mission of america turner in contrast didn't have much to say about religion positing neither the dynamism of protestantism protestantism or the decadence of catholicism is the cause for civilizational success or failure also muted in Turner's writing are the celebrations of conquering passions that accompanied the removal of Native Americans or the U.S. invasion of Mexico, which imagined the Mexicans disappearing from the earth. Turner wrote no sentence anywhere near as callous as the one composed by Theodore Roosevelt in 1889. Already, I'm have to say trigger warning. I don't even know what's coming, but it's usually going to be pretty racist. Which cited the march of civilization to condone the elimination of Native Americans. <laughs> the settler and pioneer have at bottom had justice on their side. This great continent could not have been kept as nothing but a game preserve for squalid savages. Damn. This is coming from people didn't even shower regularly. They came over here, and they're qual calling them squalid savages. They didn't shower regularly, and they were full of diseases. And they were hostile and liars who break treaties. <laughs> Turner de-emphasized genocidal hatred as a justification of U.S. expansion. Unlike, say, the historian Bernard Balin, who had recently identified a deep, pervasive racism as the motivating settler terror. There's no grape as a shock strategy in Turner's account of the frontier. Sorry, that should have been my normal voice. That's not a quote. There's no grape as a shock strategy in Turner's account of the frontier, though that strategy was used by settlers and soldiers. 
and there's no burning indigenous peoples out of their villages. There's no slaughtering their children as they fled the flames, and there's no retaliatory unalivings, and no Andrew Jackson rousing his men to pant with vengeance and turn themselves into engines of destruction. This is like the, the locker room pep talk. He said, pant with vengeance and turn yourself into engines of destruction to slaughter the creeks and mutilate their bodies. And when American history comes to be rightly viewed, Turner wrote, dismissing the importance of forced labor to the creation of U.S. wealth. It will be seen that the slavery question is just an incident. <laughs> they knew slavery was wrong. They knew it. Just three years before Turner's Chicago panel, the 7th Calvary unalived upward of 250 Sui men, women, and children at Wounded Knee, North Dakota. Yet all of the many things the frontier is, in Turner's 1893 paper, one thing the frontier is noticeably not as much of is the military front. Turner does not. Turner does note in passing that each successful frontier, the fall line of the Alleghenies, the Mississippi, the Missouri, and the 99th meridian, which is the longitude where the most prairie gives way to the most, gives way to the arid plains, the 99th meridian, was won by a series of Indian wars. <laughs> and then he proceeds to muffle the violence of these wars. That's, some, that's something people do. They muffle the violence. Good morning, it's 8 a.m. Then he proceeds to muffle the violence of these wars. Theodore Roosevelt, again, is illustrative. His many volume, The Winning of the West, published in the 1880s, begins with a classic statement of the germ principle, identifying Andrew Jackson's victory over the Creeks as one battle in a war that started with Saxon conquest of Britain, and it continued forward in a larger crusade to conquer the world's waste spaces. What? Waste spaces? This is good. What? That you wanted. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's waste until it's yours, and then it's your property. Okay, sure. Roosevelt, Roosevelt's history reads like an epic poem to the doctrine of discovery a brutalist answer to those who are beginning to show concern about the extermination of the Native Americans. Let the sentimentalists say what they will. The man who puts the soil to use must of right dispossess the man who does not, and the world will come to a standstill. Like Turner, Roosevelt believed that the frontier created a particular kind of political culture. Unlike Turner, however, Roosevelt identified the first step in this creation as wild terror and rough justice. At least since the 18th, what does this say? I'm going to read this blurb here. Later, as president, Theodore Roosevelt, in signing some of the world's first multinational legal treaties, attempted to subordinate the United States to international jurisprudence. But at home, he couldn't even subordinate the frontier justice that he had earlier celebrated. In the winning of the West, Roosevelt said vigilantism would transform into law, and it didn't. And if faced with what he called an epidemic of lynching, President Roosevelt blamed the victims. The greatest existing cause of lynching, he said in 1906, in the perpetration, especially by black men, of the hideous crime of grape. What? They're out here just creeping all the native villages. <laughs> and then they're trying to justify lynching black men because of them grape. This doesn't make any sense. Worse still, having been forced to lynch, <laughs> having been forced to lynch. Wow. White men, white men are simultaneously powerful and just useless. They were forced to lynch. White men debased themselves falling to a level with the criminal, spreading chaos, lawlessness, Roosevelt said, grown by what 
it feeds upon, and when mobs begin to lynch for grape, they speedily extend the sphere of their operation and lynch for many other kinds of crimes. Look, these people want to grape women and hurt other people. What, like, like, <sighs> at the same time, they're doing crazy stuff to the Native Americans, but they're lynching black men because they're so dangerous to them. And they're doing, they're doing crazy stuff. The projection, the double speak is absolutely baffling baffling. At least since the 18th century and continuing well past the publication of the, wi the Winning of the West, frontier vigilantism was used to suppress people of color. Roosevelt celebrated such vigilantism. When threatened, good men would band themselves together as regulators and put down the wicked with ruthless severity. <laughs> by the exercise of lynch law, shooting and hanging the worst offhand. He admitted that torture was often used, but argued that in general, such rough justice was healthy for the community. What? Roosevelt said torture and lynching was healthy for the community, and he would eventually evolve into more rational forms of state-administered jurisprudence. On the frontier, each man, even when he wasn't banding with others in a posse, <laughs> was a law unto himself, each living in the perfect freedom to work out his own morality. Pioneers were men of lawless, brutal spirit, who by subduing nature and natives also eventually subdued their own violence, calling forth civilization <laughs> and thus the backwoodsmen lived on the clearings that they had hewed out of the everlasting forest old growth forest by then a grim stern people <laughs> strong and simple powerful for good and evil swayed by gusts of stormy passion <laughs> The love of freedom rooted at the very heart's core. Wow. So when they got murderous and wanted to unalive people, they just considered that gusts of stormy passion on the way to freedom. Holy hell. <laughs> How? Okay. There's none of this drama in Turner. None of this wild, half-savage romance as Roosevelt uh, described U.S. history, which posited civilization as emerging out of cruel, relentless war, not just against nature and Native Americans, but against one's own base instincts. If the advance of Turner civilization was inevitable, it was a gentle inevitability. And if his writing presented an ode to individualism, it was a restrained individualism, more like James Stewart or John Wayne. There was a struggle, but it wasn't racial or class struggle. What moved the frontier forward, according to Turner, were laws, courts, and commerce. Not for him, Roosevelt's wolfish frontier. The Wisconsin historian wrote in a soothing prose, at its most tumultuous when it was describing the frontier as a wave but his analysis is more like the calm lapping of water on shore. Turner sings softly of American vitality. It denies heroism. He celebrates nameless types like the hunter or the farmer. It's the frontier, not men, that leaped over the Alleghenies and skipped the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains. And there's an interesting backstory to Turner's calming of American passion. As a child growing up in Portage, Wisconsin, he had gone canoeing and hiking among the Winnebago and the Menominee, a memory that he later described to his colleague as bucolic. I remember a voyage down the Wisconsin, pulled by Indians in a dugout from near Wausau and hearing a duet-like conversation between the boatmen and the squaws 
as we pass their Indian village, the guttural of the buck and the sweet, clear, laughing treble of the square, of the squaw. I remember the antlered deer who stood at the bend among the balsam firs, drinking at the river's edge, and how close we got to him in our silent canoe. Wow, that sounds beautiful. Why do you want to destroy these people? The Indians, though, would soon be gone, removed by federal troops, and boarded on federal trains, and disappeared. Troops that were invited to do the work by portage leaders, including Turner's father, a namesake of Andrew Jackson. And Andrew Jackson Turner was, according to his contemporaries, a good man and an upstanding and responsible leader in his town. And he was also a man who wanted the Winnebago and Menominee villages destroyed. They were worthless savages, as he described them in the paper he edited and published, the Wisconsin State Register and he demanded that the army drive them from the community, since they were utterly despised, disgusting everyone with their filthiness and alarming, timid women by their frightful appearance. Wow! These are the people who had to be taught how to bathe when they arrived. The military did so, according to Turner's biography. Turner's biographer. A detachment of troops arrived early in 1873 to drive the Red Men to near Nebraska Reservation, and they resisted, but soldiers pushed them westward all that summer, some almost at Bayonet Point, and some escaped into the Wisconsin woods to be rounded up by the federal troops, marched through Portage, and herded on railroad cars that would carry them westward. Why? Why are you stealing these people from their home? Why are you, why are, why can you, why are you better than them? I don't understand. And how do, how do you expect this energy to just go away of people who want to hurt other people for their own personal gain? Ay, ay, ay. Frederick was 13 years old and none of the events he witnessed, not the actions of his father, not the disgust that must have been as much a part of the family conversation as it was the register's editorial made it into his scholarship. It's the things people leave out. <laughs> Three. Turner depicted the borderlands as a place where individualism sprouted from the land like prairie seeds, prairie weeds, and only later did government and big business arrive. Complex society, he wrote, is precipitated by the wilderness. Steadily, almost calmly, they extended Woodrow Wilson similarly wrote of frontier settlers across this great continent and then wild and silent. But what we think of the West since its inception has been the domain of large scale power, of highly capitalized speculators, businesses, railroads, agriculture, and mining. Settlement tended to follow rather than proceed. Connections to national and international markets, said Richard White, historian of the West. These markets were created through federal action by, among other things, federal gunboats. Western movement required a strong state. The U.S. Army removed Native Americans and Mexicans. Government-backed bonds financed the purchase of Louisiana. Federal surveyors plotted their baselines and principal meridians well in advance of the settled frontier. And federal engineers laid out roads, public works projects, many of them carried out by the Corps of Engineers. And they irrigated arid lands in the West, and they drained swampy lands in Florida. And the secretary was distributing rifles and ammunition to settlers. Turner, raised in the maelstrom of Indian removal, knew full well the point of the state. Based on his experience of watching government soldiers round up Native Americans around his Wisconsin hometown and remove them west. And he also knew that the state preceded the frontier. In notes, he took on an 1887 essay that detailed the various ways frontier society generated an exaggerated sense of liberty and a abnormal anti-government ideology. 
Turner included telling a comment, the West of our day relies on national government because government came before the settler and gave him land and arranged his transportation, government, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, but this is a group of people who are known to bite the hand that feed. You know, um, Britain paved their way here and protected them, protected the eastern seaboard, brought all of the goods that they were accustomed to receiving um, and gave them what looked to be like normal amount of taxes for all of that effort and work. And then they still had a revolution against Britain, mostly because Britain wanted to respect the Native Americans as full people <sighs> and slavery. It was like bloodthirst is a lot of the reason behind the the revolution and you know the fact that the tea party they dressed up as native americans that was not unusual they dressed up like the natives often to put themselves in a place where they could be as savage as what they imagined that the native people were yet in turner's case studies as well as in his more sweeping generalizations he advances a different sequence one that goes more or less like this there's nature either in its raw, untouched state, or cut through by Indian trails. And then come settler families, who apply their labor to rest a clearing in the woods and create fields and pastures. And as they do this work, individual families begin to aggregate, forming communities and voluntary associations, including law and order vigilante groups. What? <laughs> These law and order groups have a history of going to other people's houses and unaliving them, okay. including law and order vigilante groups, which Turner, like Roosevelt, celebrates toned down, sanitized form. Dispersed communities start to touch hands with each other along old indigenous roads or along river valleys, creating what political scientists call civil society. And they developed commercial relations and nurture frontier values, including initiative, optimism, trust, cooperation, individualism, along with a refusal to tol tolerate despots. Trade deepens, local and national markets extend, mining and manufacturing spring up as by magic. And then the state arrives. Turner's sequence, nature, settlement, labor, Society, security, trade, more trade, which leads to more security and trust. And then government is important and then that it crystallizes a number of uniquely American ideals about the relationship between the economy, rights, and sovereignty. Labor mixed with nature creates property. Mm. Labor mixed with nature creates property. Property creates virtue. Private property Private property-based virtue exists prior to the state, and the state's only legitimate function is to protect virtue, not create virtue. Ah, this is such an in, this is a this is a very important distinction. It's supposed to protect virtue, not create virtue. This version of liberty protects people who already have capital and ignores any inequality anywhere even continuing social or structural or institutional equality. That is why I think the American version of liberty is bankrupt. Yes. So private property-based virtue exists prior to the state. And the state's only legitimate function is to protect virtue. Virtue is private property. Those things are dog whistles for each other. Uh, not create virtue. It's to protect virtue, not create virtue. <laughs> and it's a sleight of hand, the sequence. First, Turner wrote in his notes, government came before, but it was and remains a powerful move, one that premises the virtue of freedom as existing independently of the state and restricts the role of the state to only guarding the virtue. That premise makes possible the ongoing refusal of the United States to accept the legitimacy of social or economic rights. Individual inherent rights found in nature to have to bear to move to assemble to believe to possess were legitimate as was a state that protected them 
but social rights to receive health care, education, and welfare made possible by state, interven- by state intervention were perverse. Mm, interesting, interesting. They're like, th- this is the kind of society that rewards murderers and thieves. Because then if you can get all the stuff and then it's just, ah, like the root economic orientation sets up for exploitation. Okay, four. Turner didn't publish much after his frontier essay. He lectured often. And again, just summing this up, Turner had a really important big essay on pretty much like what is the word frontier mean, which before used to mean a border. But then like when he came out of it, he had 13 different definitions for frontier in that paper, none of which represented the great torture and unaliving and theft of land. He just glossed over all that stuff. And it was like a vibe. It was like a way of life. It's like frontier. Come on, guys, get over there. So Turner didn't publish much after his frontier essay, but he lectured often and mostly optimistic. These public presentations did contain dark notes in the 1890s. In the eight, in night, in, sorry, in 1890, the U.S. Census Office had declared that it would no longer use the word frontier as a descriptive category. There were so many people in the West, the office said, that there can be hardly be said to be a frontier line. This is in 1890 only, that the U.S. Census, that thing we get every 10 years, that they took the, the word frontier off. Now they ask you if you live in a trailer, a house, or apartment. But they used to be like, are you in the frontier? Meaning, are you out there unaliving Native people? Wink, wink. <laughs> there were so many people in the West, the office said, that there can hardly be said to be a frontier line. Even more important than population density, Turner knew, was the fact that the power of capital, or borrowing from Andrew Jackson, what he called money power, was outrunning what was left of the frontier. The West's effectiveness as a safety valve was, he believed, diminishing. And remember, the safety valve means that they're like, this away American life, this new vibe about everybody getting theirs, hyper-individualism, uh, this level of quality of life, they say it can only exist if America's still expanding. And so that's why they had to steal all of the black people's land, all the freedmen, and all of the native people's land, is because for America to work, they believed it had to be ever consuming. They said, oh, but that is being diminished now that the land's getting all fold up. The age of cheap land, cheap corn, and wheat, and cheap cattle has gone forever, Turner wrote in 1914. The free lands are gone, the continent is crossed, and all this push and energy is turning into channels of agitation. Increasingly now in the early 20th century, masters of industry, the coal baron, the steel king, the oil king, the cattle king, the railroad magnet, the master of high finance, the monarchs of trust, claimed now these people claim to be the true heirs of the Western ideal, fashioning themselves as pioneers. Okay, now the capitalists are coming in and being like, we're the pioneers, okay, after you guys unalived all the natives. As they seized new avenues of action and power, to expand the horizon of the nation's activity and to extend the scope of their dominion. Turner, though, rejected efforts by capitalists to apply the frontier metaphor to capital itself as a way to mollify social protest with the promise of endless economic growth. Instead, he repeatedly used the metaphor to describe government action. In place of old frontiers of wilderness, he wrote, there are new frontiers in public policy, better social domains yet unexplored. But the scale of the problem seemed to dwarf any political solution or offer. Monopolies, Turner said, had come to exercise a unified control over the nation's industrial life. You don't say colossal private fortune was corrosive okay so this is turner who is i don't know 
you could say the godfather of American history. I mean, he defined the term pioneer. Let's be real. Good morning, gray eyes. You see a word? Okay, okay. This is some interesting times. It's just, we're getting the sticky. Oh, that's the wrong page. Oh my gosh. Turner, he said that the colossal private fortune was corrosive. Turner could sound as damning as Karl Marx. Capital began to consolidate and even greater masses, subordinating the self-driven and sovereign individual who emerged during the earlier open-range stage of frontier capitalism to system and control in the factories to repetitive motion and the assembly line in the fields to mechanized farming and industrial mining in daily life to debt political democracy to turner wrote was now an appearance rather than a reality dude if this guy is in damn 18 okay he's saying in 1914 he's saying the country's bought and paid for <laughs> he's saying that in 1914 okay other social ills included congested tenements filled with growing numbers of not yet assimilated immigrants long hours of work and the unalive rate slum diseases like typhoid and all of these evils threatened to turn america's industrial energy and vast capital into a social tragedy Ten tenancy increased ownership declined oh really oh poor 1914 wages fell what you don't say it's all gone all gone all over was how another frontier writer the novelist owen wister registered a similar pessimism earlier in 1902 wister's the virginian had described the west as a world of crystal light a land without end. Can you guys stop it? Can you guys stop with the infinite resources game? Because it's not. It has an end. It's not a crystal light, okay? Even though I'm thirsty. <sighs> the Virginian had described the West as a world of crystal light. A land without end. A space in which Noah and Adam might come straight from the Genesis. <laughs> but just a few years later... Wister published another novel that imagined the frontier was not so much closed as commandeered, seized by the barons and the bankers. Hell, there's nothing united about these states anymore except standard oil and discontent, and we're no longer a small people living and unaliving for a great idea. Now we're a big old, now we're a big people living and unaliving for money the world turner said in 1925 has never seen such huge fortunes exercising complete control over the economic life of a people and has never seen such a consolidation of capital and so complete a systemization of economic processes he's saying that this country is bought and sold by 1925. Lost cause, hands up in the air. Good morning, PYT. Turner didn't pine for the smallness as a solution to the problem created by huge aggregations of capital. He knew that society in the 20th century would be mass, industrial, and large. But he hoped somehow that the experiences in the 19th century's wide and vast West would teach the United States how to deal with the problem of magnitude. Turner was having a hard time finding a middle ground, something between corporate plutocracy and socialism that could manage the transition from the frontiers of the West to the frontiers of public policy. Taking America to what he said would be the next stage of its development, to the realm of the spirit and to the domain of ideals and legislation. and there is another option to define the frontier not as a line to stop at but one to cross over to link as two other frontier theorists theodore roosevelt and woodrow wilson often did progressive reform at home to the war abroad and in 1898 the united states launched itself overseas 
That's why, because they, they couldn't find more land to steal within its borders. They had to go somewhere else. In 1898, the United States launched itself overseas. Washington annexed Hawaii and declared war on Spain, after which it took Puerto Rico, Guam, Manila, and established a proctorate over Cuba. The United States built an interoceanic canal across Panama, which it had separated from Colombia and invaded, occupied, and fought counterinsurgencies in Nicaragua, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic, which was almost for black people in the United States. <laughs> they were like, oh my God, you guys are getting lynched so much. Maybe we should just give you the Dominican Republic. That almost happened. Meanwhile, in the Philippines, the troops engaged in a lengthy pacification campaign. Theodore Roosevelt described the 1898 deployment overseas of occupying troops as a righteous war necessary to prevent the country, now that its frontier was closed, from getting too comfortable with itself and to avoid falling into a languor that he associated with Asia. I'm going to read this little note here. The war in the Philippines, ooh, this is chilling, what we, what we did to the Philippines, what we wrote about it. The war in the Philippines gave English a successor word to the frontier, used to refer to remoteness, boondocks from Tagalog, a distant, unpopulated place. <laughs> really? I'm sure they were living there. Adopted by U.S. soldiers fighting a shadowy war against hit-and-run enemies. Its usage was expanded in World War II and then shortened in Vietnam to boonies. I did not know that the word boonies came from boondocks, which is a Tagalog word, which referred to their homeland as desolate and uninhabited so that they could just get wrecked. <gasps> no, I can never say boonies again. Damn. Sometimes etymology, that's crazy. So he didn't want the United States just fall into languor. He associated with Asia. <laughs> Everyone's lazy to these Anglo-Saxon people, but them, the people who didn't want to work and just wanted to steal and destroy. Everyone else is like, the languor of Asia. Oh my goodness. The, Asia who invented everything, gunpowder, paper, <laughs> printing press before Gutenberg. Okay. <laughs> which he didn't want us to fall into the languor that he associated with Asia. We cannot, if we would, play the part of China and be content to rot by inches in ignoble ease within our borders, fighting medieval tyranny, as Roosevelt described Spain, would steal political leaders to confront modern tyranny in the form of corporate corruption and monopolies at home. That didn't happen. That did never happen. He thought fighting Spain would somehow change the American people to come home and fight the corporations? What? <laughs> okay, for his part, Woodrow Wilson, who, like Roosevelt, would become a president noted for progressive reforms, identified America's post-1898 wars in the Pacific and the Caribbean as part of its permanent revolution on the frontier a great revolution in our lives he said a new revolution no war ever transformed us quite <laughs> as the war with spain transformed us the military campaigns that puerto rico the philippines and guam under united states occupation and made cuba an informal colony wasn't just transformative it completed the transformation, and it transformed into what Wilson didn't say. But Turner once used the phrase, the Imperial Republic. Wow. That's what they're calling America in like the year like 1900. They're like, this is the Imperial Republic. Despots, the whole lot of you. To describe the post-1898 United States, we made new frontiers for ourselves beyond the seas. Wilson said, as president, he dispatched troops to Mexico twice. And in 1915, he ordered 
a marine occupation that over the course of two decades left 15,000 Haitians unalived and many more tortured. <laughs> 15,000. Okay, wow. Many more tortured and extended Jim Crow like rule, including the establishment of a form of a public works forced labor over the Black Republic. Yes, yes. There were tumultuous, consequential wars that extended the United States military and legal frontier 7,000 miles into the Pacific and at least as far south as Panama. And they brought tens of millions of people, most of them of color and speaking Spanish and Tagalog under U.S. authority, raising vexed constitutional questions. And yet, Turner describes the period with aloof phrasing, especially when compared to his contemporaries Roosevelt and Wilson. Having colonized the far west, having mastered its internal resources, he wrote in 1910, the nation turned at the conclusion of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century to deal with the Far East, to engage in the world politics of the Pacific Ocean, having brought to its logical conclusion its long-continued expansion into the lands of the old Spanish Empire by the successful outcome of the recent war. The United States became the mistress of the Philippines at the same time that it came into possession of the Hawaiian Islands. <laughs> How that happened was absolutely criminal. <laughs> and the controlling influence in the Gulf of Mexico. So he's using words like became the mistress or came into possession. <laughs> and it all floats by like a dream, as if the United States had empire just thrust upon it. Yeah, when they do these things, it's always very passive wording. I came into possession of, <laughs> I'm going to, that's such evasive wording. Turner was reluctant to extend his arguments concerning the rejuvenating power of the frontier to the realm of imperial expansion. Yet he went with the flow and he first supported Wilson's initial policy of staying out of World War I. But when Wilson re reversed himself, Turner reversed himself. The Germans the original repository of the mother seed. Yes, that's where the Anglo-Saxons come from. And it's so confusing when I read their writings because they would say, oh, the motherland, the motherland. I always think the motherland is Africa. It means Germany. <laughs> or the mother seed. This is where eugenics really started from this idea. This is the mother seed. The Germans, the original repository of the mother seed, became the evil seed. If social conditions couldn't be reformed at home to protect actual individuals, then at least the ideal of individualism could be sharpened in the fight against its opposite, Germanic militarism. Turner's defense of Wilson's war, presented in a series of lectures in 1918, rehearsed all his old arguments, but an exaggerate of form. Turner went so far in casting Germany's militarism as the absolute antithesis to the american individualism but that, that's your that's your people that he slipped into a rare explicit race consciousness the prussian discipline is the discipline of thor the war god against the discipline of the white christ he wrote turner's cooling of the racist heat that powers Jacksonian settler colonialism was indispensable. By 1898, the United States stood at the threshold of global power, and there were just too many different kinds of people ab abroad for the United States to treat the world as Louisiana or the Mexican session writ large. It would take some time for the legal and political systems to catch up and shed its explicit Saxonism. Yeah, I mean, this like Anglo-Saxon thing, yeah, it's not gonna work everywhere. <laughs> we are mainly Anglo-Saxon, 
said Texas Representative James Sladen in 1909. While Puerto Ricans are a complete structure, largely mongrels. Why did he need to say that? Why? Okay. Okay, this is a Texas representative, Jane Slayton, okay. But in the first years of the 20th century, expansion, be it commercial, political, or military, couldn't be justified as but a new edition of Teutonic conquest and the latest victory of blood gene. They found themselves by losing themselves. Turner once said of Europeans who had been transformed on the frontier into Americans. And that's what happened. In a way, to America's manifest destiny, a phrase coined in 1845 to describe the belief that providence was guiding Anglo-Saxons across the continent to take Texans and California and establish dominion from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It found its universalism by losing its racial and religious particularism. White supremacy, though, continued, keeping the beat moving forward in Jim Crow, in lynchings, in anti-miscegenation, exclusion, second-class citizen laws, and in the racism of the ruling class, including in President Woodrow Wilson's ongoing arias to wholesome blood. But Turner's soothing processional became the official public anthem of a nation moving out in the world, not as a conquering race, but much less a woodland Germanic tribe. In the name of humanity, they're doing this for humanity. They're killing all the humans. The humans, in the name of humanity. 1900 to 1920 is when suddenly there was an immigration problem all of a sudden. This is all the prelude to the first eugenics movement. I do like to uh, uh, bring up and admit uh, the very first eugenics movement in this country was, was targeted against white immigrants, people that they called near whites. They wanted to control them so that they can have more of the Anglo-Saxon whites. And they did horrible things to people, forced exterminations, forced uh, sterilizations, uh, the worst thing you could imagine. There was a second eugenics movement in this country. Remember, we had a United States office of eugenics that was based out of Cold Spring, New York. And that second wave of eugenics was directed almost explicitly at black women. And that peaked in the 1970s. So this kind of thinking we can see is a hotbed, you know, for this wholesome blood. At this point, people are starting to write books about eugenics and breeding and blood and how only the Anglo-Saxons deserve to live and everyone else should suffer at their feet. Margaret Sanger is a very complicated figure because I actually do believe that she came out with some selfish and good intentions. And I definitely believe that she was swayed by the power that being racist afforded her. And that's just my personal interpretation. So I consider her a very complex figure, uh, I guess, fallen tragic hero kind of a thing. They documented this so much that this is this is what we, yeah, there, there's so much documentation of this. Um, but with this wholesome blood thing, we can see how... This is a precursor to the eugenics thinking, which I think we could have a third eugenics movement starting in this country. And remember, there's two kinds of eugenics. There's positive eugenics and negative eugenics. Negative eugenics is unaliving and sterilizing people. Positive eugenics is unnaturally forcing other people to have more birth. And since the overturning of Roe versus Wade, there have been what they consider 10,000 excessive births as a result of this policy. And so we can see this as a form of positive eugenics. Will there be a matching backlash of negative eugenics to follow this? The pattern of history says, yes, this is the thing that we need to watch out for because these things usually go hand in hand, like when we just like look at the cycles. But we are starting to see positive eugenics and we may have a third eugenics wave in America if we're not careful to look at history. Okay. But Turner's soothing processional became the official public anthem of a nation moving out into the world, not as a conquering race, much less 
a woodland Germanic tribe, in the name of humanity. Turner also put forward his version of American universalism at a moment when class conflict was on the rise. Demands for redistribution of wealth were growing increasingly militant as industrial capitalism swung between ever more dramatic booms and busts and the number of strikes fueled by immigrant workers from countries with strong socialist traditions increased. In fact, the 1893 World's Fair, where Turner first presented his frontier thesis, was something like one large labor action. Plasterer, gas fitter, carpenter, bricklayers, and mechanic unions took advantage of the concentration of work to press for higher wages and shorter hours. That year, a financial crash led to a wave of factory closings and rising labor conflict, organized by the socialist Eugene Debs and the American Railway Union, striking Pullman Company railroad workers, they effectively closed access to the frontier, making sure no freight or passenger trains rolled farther west than Detroit. President Grover Cleveland sent tens of thousands of troops redeployed from western territories to break the strike and get the trains running again. Deb's union was dissolved and scores of workers lost their lives. Lots of German immigrants in Franklin's adopted state of Pennsylvania. Was he referring to that? I mean, there were, there were German immigrants all over. Yeah, sorry about Debs. A few years later, the progressive <laughs> Woodrow Wilson used the considerable resources of the federal government to execute one of the most violent crackdowns on radical labor unions and left-wing political parties in the country's history, a repression that increased after, after the country entered World War I. The war and its aftermath, as Adam Hochschild has written, was a period of unparalleled censorship, mass imprisonment, and anti-immigrant terror. What? The industrial workers of the world and the Socialist Party were destroyed. And Wilson's 1917 Espionage Act, which Turner in, endorsed as a temporary sacrifice of individual freedom necessary to counter German efforts to destroy freedoms everywhere, target thousands of activists. But Philip Randolph and Eugene Debs were thrown in jail for opposing the war. Can you believe that? Patriotic fever empowered vigilantes to go on the hunt for any perceived subversion of Americanism. There's so much of American history that is empowered by the, just these, like, vigilantes. <laughs> like, we are a country of vigilantes at this point. A pro-Wilson crowd assaulted Alice Paul and other members of her anti-war National Woman's Party, as they protested in front of the White House. Why are you attacking these ladies? In Elaine, Arkansas, white vigilantes with help from the U.S. Army slaughtered. Okay, so here's the thing. Is that like, I, think, I know a lot of men are saying, you know, women, you'll never be equal because we can always hurt you more. There's plenty of men saying that on the internet. You know, like, this is the way things are. And it's like, well, how about we just like stay strapped? <laughs> well, we wouldn't because then it's like, oh, look at them. They're not peaceful. They're being strapped. And it's like, well, you can have weapons that are your hands. Why can't we just have weapons? Like all the time. Seems like that would equal things out. <laughs> Thanksgiving comes to mind. It does. It sure does. We've always been, this is a country of vigilantism. Wow. The industrial workers of the word world and the socialist party were destroyed. Wilson's 1917 Espionage Act, which Turner endorsed as a temporary sacrifice to individual freedom necessary to counter the Germans' efforts to destroy freedom everywhere, target thousands of activists. And A. Philip Randolph and Eugene Debs were thrown in jail for opposing the war, and patriotic fever empowered vigilantes to go on the hunt for any perceived subversion of Americanism. 
and a pro-Wilson crowd assaulted Alice Paul and her members of her anti-war National Woman's Party, and they protested in front of the White House. And in Elaine, Arkansas, white vigilantes, with help from the U.S. Army, slaughtered 237 sharecroppers for trying to organize a union with the U.S. Army helping? These are people in a second slavery. That's what a sharecropper is. For trying to organize a union and just one episode of the relentless race terror African Americans faced since the end of Reconstruction, which included over 40,000 lynchings. 40,000 at the time when the population of this country was much less. The world was you're a Ben Franklin lover? Well, there's a lot to like about Ben Franklin. <laughs> he wasn't exactly a paragon of moral excellence. <laughs> 40,000. That is such a significantly, I guess, like biblical number, like in just the sheer level of just all done by vigilantes, by vigilantes, by crowds, people who were prominent in history, a president said that these gusts of passion were good for community. The IWW had plenty of cowboy radicals. Across. Okay, I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this. Debs in 1902. The rise of class-conscious traitors' unionism in the West was not the result of mere chance or personal design, but obedient to the rising tide of the revolutionary spirit of the proletariat of the rugged and sparsely settled mountain states. A composite population composed of pioneers, the most adventurous, brave, and freedom-loving men from all the states of American continent. And in 1924, the bold, assertive spirit of the pioneer, the one-time free American, could not survive in this generation of concentrated wealth and power and intensified wage slavery. The spy system and the blacklist are especially effective in these one-company towns, be they lumber, coal, copper, oil, or money, to destroy the free spirit that was once the glory of America. The glory of America was also murderous, so it's like, I don't even know how to feel like like there's nobody innocent here in any of this story. Everybody's doing everybody wrong. It's like, well, the settlers and the pioneers were just like unaliving good people in their homeland, ancestral homeland. Like they were doing what Israel's doing right now. And it's like, and then they got screwed over by corporations. And it's like, ah, well, <laughs> I'm sorry that happened to couldn't happen to worse people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, the IWW had plenty of cowboy radicals among its ranks, drawing much support in Western and border states from mine workers, lumberjacks, and ranch hands. Debs himself often tried to offer an alternative socialist version of the frontier thesis, but the myth of rugged individualism was applied more effectively against socialists and anti-war activists, used to draw a bright line between Americanism and anti-Americanism. And Theodore Roosevelt matched up the hands on his Dakota ranch against Chicago's Haymarket labor anarchists. My men here in Dakota are hard-working laboring men who work longer hours for no greater wages than the strikers. But they are Americans through and through. <laughs> Nothing, he said, would give them greater pleasure than a chance with their rifles at one of the mobs. Whoa. <laughs> okay, he said. You guys think you're American? I know guys working way longer for dirt cheap. Those are real Americans. They're going to come over here and turn this into an active shooter situation. <laughs> um, okay. The Western uh, novelist Owen Wister agreed 
celebrating the dispatch of the United States troops just come from fighting Indians to, di to disperse Chicago strikers. Wow. <laughs> what a week. You over here on a lot of people in their ancestral home. It's like, what? Some white people trying to raise up and get rights over here? All right. Boom. So they went over to disperse the Chicago strikers. For Wister, the use of troops against radicals. Rats who swarm over our body social. And that served a double purpose. It put down the radicals, but it also focused the energies of the soldiery now that there were no more Indians left to fight. Oh, yeah, you have to, you have to, when you have a, a big military, a big militia people, you have to keep giving them new victims. That's what the Crusades were. The Crusades were like, there was kind of like a lull in history, and they're like, oh my God, we have such big armies. What do we do? And it's like, I don't know, I'm just send them on some kind of crusade. <laughs> So it served a double purpose. Yes, it put down the radicals, but it also focused the energies of the soldiery. Now that there were no more Indians left to fight, <laughs> preventing them from being attracted to the radical doctrines offered by the Debses of the country. Huh? And Wister was particularly enraged at Deb's ability to shut down train service west, since he considered the Continental Railroad one of civilization's greatest achievements. Vigilance, wrote Wister, is the price of liberty, not only from foreign but domestic foes. And the power of the frontier, Americanism, is found in its ability to marginalize Rooseveltism-style racism with deep roots in America's settler reality and Debsian-style social democracy, along with deep roots in America's promise of equality and to reconcile them into a vibrant, progressive ideal that presented itself as the highest expression of liberal universalism. Turner imagined the experience of westward expansion, overcoming sectional loyalties and racial animosities, leading to a true humanism, nurturing open-minded citizens capable of addressing the problems of mass industrial society with applied progressive and responsible policies. Turner also thought that the experience of the West, of different states coming together to cooperate over resources and trade, well, that would serve as the model for Woodrow Wilson's League of Nations. And his centrist pioneer, progressivism, even found expression and pop culture as in the cowboy code of the beloved western entertainer gene autry star of rodeo radio and screen on one hand the cowboy according to autry's commandments must not advocate or possess racially or religiously intolerant ideas oh they're rebranding the pioneers into cowboys Woo, okay, all right. And born out of the ceaseless expansion, do you know what? I think the brand of the cowboy to like maybe even redirect and sanitize um, archetype the personality of the frontiersman who's just unaliving people. I think it's actually really similar in a lot of ways to I think Japan's wave of anime which when they came out with all the cutesy anime was in part to sanitize their sort of like international uh, like, you know, vibe. And so I think, you know, the mythology of the cowboy sought to do that in a way to, to evolve and to sanitize and to muffle a little of the violence. Uh, yeah. He said, cowboys, they're under, they don't have, they must not advocate or possess any racially or religiously intolerant ideas. We're on this land where we murdered people because they were different, but it's time to put those ideas to the side because we're good people now. <laughs> on the other, the cowboy must also be a good worker and be a patriot. And born out of ceaseless expansion, Turner's frontier universalism along with its 
imagined suppression of extremes could only be maintained through ceaseless expansion. Ceaseless expansion. Well, that concludes the reading for today. And tomorrow, I will continue logging on a little bit after about 6 a.m. with a coffee and a smile to read you one more chapter tomorrow. Uh, the Pact of 1898. And then I'll be back. When will you be back? Look over here. Monday, Tuesday, Friday. Coming in at 6 a.m. Till we read this book. It'll be done by the end of this month. We're going to read 8, The Pact of 1898. But on Friday, it's a bonus day. We're going to do two chapters. So we're going to do A Fortress on the Frontier and A Psychological Twist. What? What could be more psychologically twisting than what we just wrote, read right here today? I don't know. Let's find out. Everything I've read thus far, all the previous chapters, if you'd like to catch up, they're actually up on my YouTube, if you'd like. So I also, before I upload them to YouTube, automate all of the gaps in my speaking. So it progresses much faster. And that is just a little bit of a bonus. So... Uh, it's more condensed. Put it on the background as you're cleaning. Learn the real American history that our schools did not teach because there's some things I would have wanted to know, but they were not included. Um, so I think we can all come to the same reality together about history. And I think we can let us dictate us to a realistic way forward so we can stop repeating the same patterns. Guess what today is? Please tell me. Um, somebody is requesting Heath Jillian. Well, how, we've never met before. Please state your intent. Thank you, Hi. Queen Lover, for the listening. <gasps> Happy birthday to you. Thank <laughs> you. Happy born day, baby. Thank you. <laughs> I'm on my white woman uh, shit this, today. It's fabulous. Are you listening and learning? Yes, uh, I, I went to Pilates and I'm going to go get cupping done. I'm going to get my nails done. Cupping done? Cupping. I didn't like know Chinese that was an mapping. option. I didn't know that was an option of a thing that we could just start doing. Please. Is that when they put the cups on your back? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. They did that to George Washington. He didn't make it. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let him do any bloodletting. <laughs> no leeches. Good morning, Heath. Good morning. Uh, happy birthday, Alex. Thank you. Happy birthday. So what did you think of the reading, Heath? Um, I've read this book a little bit. I haven't read it all the way through. I think I'm almost at the end. Um, I read a lot of books just because, uh, just to get information, obviously. But um, I feel like this book is a lot. There's, there's quite a bit of misinformation. I'm not saying everything is wrong, but it doesn't really give you all history. Mm-hmm. And no book uh, does, but 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 specifically, where do you think it's lacking? Uh, it's lacking in the um uh, uh the alpha and the omega stuff, the uh, the safety value. Are you ready for the um uh, the true uh relief and stuff like that? Wait, those are the chapters. That's like a yes. In the book. But if you read through them, mm -hmm. they're lacking a lot of misinformation. Oh, okay. Can you point anything out in particular? Uh, I can't remember because I don't have a good memory, but um, I'm trying to think of something. Uh, that you're just wrong and God will save you. Okay, so that was fruitful. Oh, no. Did he leave on his own? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I think that they like like to posit themselves like, it's like based on logic, but but it really isn't. It's it's really just a desire to have their way and win. So I I think we've seen the behavior before. Yeah. Good morning, Groovy Beard. How are you? I'm good. I just got signed into work about 15 minutes ago, so starting my work week. But I saw you were reading, so I hopped on here too while I'm while I'm doing a capitalism. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love a little capitalism in the morning. But. Uh, <laughs> But um, the book, it actually, it tried to pull a what about Chicago. <laughs> Wait. It's like, there's no more Indians to fight. But what about Chicago? It did. We can go, we can go over here and fight these white radicals that are rising up. 
I mean, I don't even know. I mean, I feel like how must it feel to be like one of those soldiers who like back to back is like, okay, I'm finding these like Indian Native American people for my country. And then I was like, okay, now I got to go find citizens of my country. Like, yeah, wow. well, that's what that's what the police do. I mean, we have we have our army out here like, let's go fight these Afghanis. Let's go fight these Iraqis. But then at home, we have the police saying, let's fight the citizens of our country. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah, we're still doing it. They just kind of set the standard back then, huh? They sure did. And so many, so much of militias and stuff like that, like vigilantes. So like so much of history progressed because like a bunch of people are like, all right, everybody's going to pretend like half the white dudes aren't going to all do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I'm re- just uh, these chapter names are well, wow. Yeah. And I'm sure he just misspoke. And I didn't want to be like the asshole calling somebody out on misspeaking. But did anyone else notice that that dude said that the book is missing a lot of misinformation? Yeah. <laughs> I know. I yeah. know. I loved that part. I was like, okay, missing some misinformation. That, that's how the Republicans feel about stuff. Sometimes you tell on yourself. Like, your brain actually does that. <laughs> Just needs more misinformation. Uh, yeah. really nothing there. I was about to give him the platform. I was going to put him on. I was going to Google stuff. I was going to take it to the end of the road because I like to know the truth, the actual truth. Yeah. Look, it's controversy drives the uh, universe, right? Look, it sure does. It sure does. And I'm driven to say thank you to all those who joined today for this book reading. And I hope you consider returning tomorrow for just one more chapter. Uh, the pact of 1898 i'm sure it's going to be a great and hopeful pact right and everyone's going to be holding hands and nothing please. bad's going to happen so please join for what should be just a sunshiny moment as we describe the pact of 1898 thank you guys last words of the day would you have a message for the people you make it to the world to make it to the world that's a good one Groovy Bear, do you have any last message for the people? For the people, uh, people remember to wish Alex a happy birthday. And uh, let's try and have a great work week. Let's do it, guys. All right. See you tomorrow. Bye.